Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television and theater. And today we're joined by the wonderful Mary Holland who is the co-writer and actor in the current Hulu film, Happiest Season. And I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about the writing process because you were co-writing it with Clea Duvall um, and you actually met together on Veep and hadn't known each other previously when she asked you to jump in and write the script with her and had an initial outline. So was really interested in in kind of like what stage the script was at when you came into it and what that was like in terms of diving in together and navigating learning each other's writing and creative collaboration styles. Yeah so Clea I has had this idea for a really long time and she had drafted like a, a one page like summary outline of like this is the basic arc of the movie this is what the story I want to tell and then when she asked me to write it with her, you know, I had only ever written sketches and like <laughs> very short comedy pieces. So th the whole process of writing a movie was so new to me. Um, and Clea from the get go knew she wanted to direct it. And so she really had the, the vision and the, she guided us the whole way through that process of like, um, from the beginning to, you know, when it was time to go into production. Um, so I really didn't have like a, an existing writing style. I, I sort of discovered it as I was writing with Clea. Um, and she, she was, it, it was very helpful to me actually to like, because she's so clear on story structure and so clear on how she wanted to tell this story that I really just got to learn so much from writing alongside her. And we, for the first like few weeks that we were meeting, we would just talk about this idea and we would just brainstorm like, what is this world? And who, who are the characters that surround our two main characters? And how can we like make them as, uh, three-dimensional and funny and uh, relatable as possible. So it was just a lot of talking for a long time, just brainstorming, brainstorming, taking notes. And then after a few weeks, we moved into the outline, which was really just scene by scene, just like writing out a sentence or two of, this is what happens in this scene. This is what happens in this scene. Um, and that was like, I would say that was the most like, intensive part of the writing process because we had to like decide how it was going to take shape <laughs> you know those first few weeks it was just it was just very like conversational and very um brainstormy and then it was like okay now we have to decide what scenes happen when and how can we propel the the story forward um and then when it was time to go to draft, we spent two weeks, we met like eight hours every day and we just went scene by scene and just wrote the dialogue, wrote it out. Um, yeah, and it was great. Like we, we were together the whole time. You know, there was no her going away and writing a few scenes and me going away and writing a few scenes. We like really like combed through the entire thing together. Yeah, I was really interested in the process and journey of kind of just learning the structure of, of screenwriting from your perspective, since you were mentioning that you'd just written short form and, and sketches before. Yeah. But at the same time, because you've been a performer for so long and you've had to read scripts in a really analytical way, did you find that it kind of came very naturally or were there things that you kind of learned through that process about just how you needed to structure certain things out along the way? Yeah, I think... I'm sure there were, <laughs> my cat's meowing. Um, I'm sure there were some things that were like instinctive that like the, especially the moments of comedy that, that we wanted to like infuse in the script that I definitely felt very, um, like it was, it was fun to sort of discover in the moment of, oh, I, I'm contributing this, like, <laughs> I have something to contribute. Um, I had been doing comedy for, live comedy for so long, improv and sketch, and it was just sort of in my, uh, it was just like kind of second nature to me. And so in those moments when we, 
came into those moments in the script where it was time to like pitch a joke. Or, you know, we I really was, uh, it was so fun to discover like, oh, I, I can like write comedy within a narrative form. Like it doesn't have to just be uh, a full blown sketch where the comedy is the entire point of it. I can like infuse my kind of comedy can also work within a narrative structure. Um, yeah, so, so that was really cool to discover. And then I think it, for sure, I learned so many lessons from this process and from Clea uh, because she really, she just understands inherently how to tell a good story and what things are necessary to do that and what things might be fun, but maybe they don't actually serve the story and having that judgment of like, how can we like tell this story in as clear, concise and um, uh, efficient, mm -hmm. you know, way as possible. So that I really, yeah, learned a lot about like what scenes are necessary and what scenes maybe you don't need. Yeah, and there, there's something interesting that she mentioned about in terms of, of the central story that, you know, with, with coming out that there's kind of a splintering effect and it's not just the effect on that individual person but everyone around, which is really what you both capture so beautifully and so well within the script. And I was interested in kind of how that perspective and that angle really informed the way that you developed the other characters and, and gave them additional layers through that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the thing we really wanted to explore with the Caldwell family is that they all are operating with this idea of what they should be in their minds, like this sort of perfect family ideal that they're all trying to live up to in various ways and feeling like they can't fully be themselves uh, and all the characters feeling that way with the exception of maybe Jane. <laughs> and so then when Harper has this has this moment where she decides to be honest and be true to herself and share that with her family. I think it it opens the door for all the other members of the family to to have the safety and the vulnerability to also share who they really are. And you know, I think that that moment when you do that when you share yourself with your family or your friends or whoever, it's so scary because there you don't totally know how it's going to be received and if you're going to be supported. You hope that you are, but I think that that fear kept many members of this family from truly like knowing each other. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is, a really incredible thing that we got to experiment with with this family of like, oh, let's see them all know each other for the first time. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of the genre being a rom-com, it kind of, it strips away the need to circumvent audience expectations in terms of where the plot's gonna go. You kind of know from the premise roughly what that structure is gonna be. So right. does it allow you to have more of a centralized focus on really just thinking about character development since you don't need to worry about kind of trying to lead the audience down a different path to surprise them? Right, right, exactly. And yeah, and that that was like such a, it, it's so fun to know that where you're going to end up with it and then to really like then craft these arcs for these characters that feel like a real journey for them. Like even though, you know, the ending, you can probably guess <laughs> what that is or is very clear from the genre, even within that the journey that these characters go on, it's still surprising and transformational and it's, um, you know, these characters are, they're so special to me. And we spent so long, like, really making sure that they felt fully fleshed out. And like, they're, they're not just characters that are meant to serve the main storyline, they have their own storylines. And yeah, that I think was was really fun to play with in this genre. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. every single character that comes onto screen has agency and has a lot of yeah. depth. And it really comes across. And I want to ask you a little bit about then on the performance side, what that looked like, because you'd been so intrinsically involved in developing all of the characters and, you know, especially yours, Jane. And so how that kind of caused a difference in the way that you then broke down what you were going to do performance wise, because you already knew the lines and you already knew kind of the beats of the of the comedy so intrinsically yeah. compared to what you would usually do when you get a script. Totally. Yeah. And Jane is so, we, we infused her with so many details that are true to me. <laughs> so if, I remember like sitting down, it was the, the week before I was going to start shooting. And I like sat down with, I, of course had read the script a million times, but I was like, well, no, now I need to read the script and like, think about like, how am I going to do it? <laughs> so I like went through and I remember going through each scene and remembering writing all these jokes and moments for Jane that that were so fun to come up with and then when it came down to like okay but now I really I have to deliver I have to like make sure that I can execute these these things that we've written for her in the way that we have imagined mm -hmm. um and I was really nervous I was nervous about like uh you know, I really wanted to like make Clea proud and I wanted to do Jane justice and I wanted to like hold, you know, bring what I could to the table with this phenomenal cast that we had. And um, once I stepped on set though, it was, it was the freedom and the joy I felt in playing. Like there was a real sense of play amongst everybody. Um, and Clea created that on set. It was such a uh, relaxed and calm and like supportive environment. And I think we all felt this, this safety to like try things and, and play. And there were so many moments that I found with Jane and performing her that I didn't foresee when we were writing her. And that was, that was really cool. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about shaping the dynamic amongst the sisters on screen who you play alongside Mackenzie Davis and Alison Brie, because your character Jane is very much like the Marsha Brady. She's very much the middle child who gets left out of every situation, desperately wants to be a part of everything. And, you know, even just the fact that you make that part of the plot and make that part of the writing and who she is as a character to such an intrinsic level. I was interested in kind of like how much that performed, informed the way that you then kind of crafted that relationship with Mackenzie and Alison on screen together. Yeah, I, so Jane is the one member of this family who is just entirely herself and doesn't apologize for it. She has such a deep well of self-love. And I think it was so, it was so fun discovering like how she plays off of the different energies from Mackenzie and Allison who are just so, so funny incredible actors of course but the I have a sister I know Mackenzie has a sister Allison I'm, I'm not sure if she has a sister or not but that that the di sisterly dynamic was really familiar to me just from my personal life and we just slipped right into it it was all the moments with Jane and Sloan those were those were so fun to discover with Allison like Allison you know, Sloan is this very buttoned up, very like in control person. And I think Jane's whimsy is sort of like, <laughs> not necessarily off-putting, but it, it, it throws off her like sense of control. And there was so many moments when we would have scenes in the kitchen together with all the sisters and Tipper and, you really felt that where it was like, oh, Jane throws off everybody's illusion of control. Mm -hmm. And that makes people uncomfortable and they just want her to stop. They want to like contain her <laughs> uh, because otherwise she's just like, there's no predicting where she's gonna go and you have to be able to predict how everything's gonna go. That's how this family runs. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was so fun. 
And in terms of the way that she kind of throws off everyone's sense of control, what you do so brilliantly is I feel like there's so many moments where a scene has a particular tone and then you kind of swoop in and manage to completely flip it on its head and, and bring in a different kind of comedic tone to it. And I was interested in what the challenge of that is because it's not that you're coming in and you're feeding off the energy that's already there. You're coming in and bringing an entirely new kind of like tone and dynamic to scenes so many times throughout the film. Yeah, Jane, I think, and, and I have this a little myself, Jane is just so excited to be alive. <laughs> so that is like the engine that drives her. Like she, she, she is wildly empathetic and, and keenly aware of like where everybody's at and who's uncomfortable and who's not and how can she help that dynamic. So it's not that she's like, uh, oblivious to the world around her. It's just that she herself has this like furnace of joy <laughs> that it, it moves her through the world. And I think she just, that brings her into every space she goes into. Like she, she enters a room and is just like, we're here, we're in this room. <laughs> so that it was really fun. It was just, it was, it was such a delight to be in that uninhibited joyful place emotionally yeah. and to not not feel like she's not worried about what other people are thinking about her and I think that that also informs like how she's able to like step into these spaces and have her own rhythm mm -hmm. uh yeah did that inform a lot of the choices that Clea made in terms of, of camera and choreography and blocking of the scenes? Because it very much feels like, you know, Jane's are literally always sometimes physically moved by her family when they're taking a Christmas picture. Right. That's like, oh, you stand at the edge. Yeah. And there's so many other scenes where you just notice that, like, you're constantly placed on the edge of a scene for that particular purpose and reason. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I have no doubt that that was an intentional move. I mean, I remember when we were writing writing the script, there were uh, that moment of like taking the picture and like Jane get out of the middle. Um, all of that was for sure like carefully laid in there to really illustrate mm -hmm. how this family sees Jane and, and how she's just not bothered by it. She's just like, fine, <laughs> I'll go, yeah, I'll sit on the floor. I'm happy to sit wherever. Um, and I think in a way they also take advantage of that or they, they sort of take that for granted where it's like, oh, she'll be fine. We don't need to worry about Jane or her feelings or like what's going on. Um, and yeah, I think I think the how it visually played out was such brilliant directing on Clea's part because even with no dialogue, you you can see and you can feel how this family interacts with each other and what Jane's place in it is. And it's usually to the side. <laughs> One of the details that I also really enjoyed is that Jane is writing a series of fantasy books that she's been working on for about 10 years. Yeah. In film. And there's so many moments where people just get caught off guard and she's talking their ear off, kind of describing the plot and the characters. And so I wanted to ask you kind of just even in terms of when you were writing the script, but then also for yourself, how far evolved that was beyond the little snippets and the lines that we get within there? Because obviously it needs to be structured so that what you're saying still makes sense in, in, in some degree. Totally. What I discovered in the shooting of those scenes where I would be talking at length, like I, I remember there was a scene, it was right before the start of the, the Christmas party, the, the white elephant party. And I'm talking about my book and th there were, I think there was maybe one line or something in the script, but I had to like continue talking because of you know the, the length of time that the camera was moving. And the thing that I discovered, <laughs> I really leaned into this aspect of fantasy fiction and specifically like Tolkien fiction, which is heavily detailed, so detailed that like, you would never necessarily need to know everything that's written on the page. But so I would just like, I just sort of plunged myself into this world we had created and just went through every I just made up all of these details and then that detail led to that detail and that de like I <laughs> I could talk probably for like 10 minutes 
about the world of the shadow dreamers and who the shadow dreamers are. Like I came up with this whole like history <laughs> of the shadow dreamers and how they were almost eliminated at one point and then they, you know, came back. Um, so also on our amazing production designer created the, um, the, uh, the cover of the book, uh, Shadow Dreamers and the Second Sister. And on the back, there's like a detailed like synopsis of the plot of the book, which was so, so brilliant. Yes, I feel like this will be like a, a whole other franchise is the Shadow Dreamers and all the like how we've created this, this whole universe and have all these snippets of details and someday we'll make them all make sense. <laughs> I also I love the way that you know in terms of kind of going back to the framing a little bit that even when you're very much kind of like in the periphery of a shot or in the background you still make every single second of screen time count like there's a great scene at a party and the camera just pans across and we see you just for a couple of seconds dancing in the background and it's the funniest <laughs> dance that I've seen in a movie in a while. And so I just wanted to ask about, you know, for you just kind of like understanding and knowing that no matter what's happening in a scene, no matter where the focus is, like the amount of detail that needs to go into every choice that you make. Right. I mean, I think that being Jane was such second nature to me that, and, and again, like living in that joyful space it was, I was just having the best time living it. Like it, it almost like the cameras would stop rolling and I would still be in that zone. <laughs> um, the dancing in particular, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I remember when we were like shooting that, that part of this scene where I'm dancing and <laughs> Clea let the cameras roll for like 10 or 15 minutes and I was doing <laughs> The most insane things on the dance floor. Um, I'm thrilled that there's like a, a part of that in the movie because it was, uh, I really just let her rip. Jane just, you know, <laughs> lost herself in the dance, which as, as she would, you know, she's like, she loves music and to like move her body and everything. Um, yeah, I feel like I almost went into a sort of Zen, like trance-like state with Jane where I just like, I just lived, I just saw the world through her eyes. And so every moment was, was, yeah, it was her. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit as well about your improv studying kind of when you were first starting out your career, because you studied at a couple of different places and had the opportunity to kind of be in one space that really focused on formation of character and, and the vitalness of that. And then somewhere like UCB, where it was very much about, you know, kind of like the scene and the team and what makes something so specifically funny and the way that studying in different spaces with those different focuses was a really valuable way to kind of pull together all of those different skill sets in, into what has become kind of your comedic voice and your comedic brand. Right, absolutely. The first few years of my education, it was, uh, we rarely ever did comedy. <laughs> like it was, it was all like very intense drama. Um, a lot of like Russian, you know, like Chekhov and, and it really, yes, as you were saying, like delving into the creation of a character and the, the how you can live in the emotional world of this character and uh, create real authentic, genuine moments from this, this character's point of view. Um, and that, that foundation of commitment to a moment or a, a, a point of view of a character, I carried that with me when I started doing improv. And a really cool thing that I discovered as I was like learning improv and, and playing and uh, joining these different groups and doing shows was that, oh, I, one of my strengths as, a, as an improviser is how dramatic I can play things. <laughs> which it, it sounds sort of counterintuitive to like that it's funnier the more serious you play something but that was a, a thing that I discovered was like oh this this tool kit that I have of that I learned in this intensive acting program is necessary it's vital to like making something funny for me 
um, and heightening in a way. I one of the things I love the most about improv is how how you can make a totally invisible world feel so fully real. And the way you do that is you, yeah, you you commit, you you live in that character's point of view and you you like make the refrigerator look like a refrigerator. I don't know why a refrigerator was a thing that came up. <laughs> but you sort of like you use space work to create this invisible world and the you paint it for the audience. And the more you're actually in that world, the more they get to like enjoy it and those funny moments are even funnier. Yeah. And one of the teams that you're a part of is, is of course, Wild Horses. Mm -hmm. And I was so fascinated to learn that the genesis of it was that you were actually all in a book club together. And then Lauren Lapkus got asked to do a performance um, and whether she had an all female team and that that kind of led to just a very impromptu forming of that, that team. And was interested in kind of like what that first performance was like, because you didn't have that kind of sense of each other's rhythms in that space yet. And just kind of like how you kind of navigated feeling it out in that, that first show that you all did together. Oh man that whole trip because it was we went to a festival in Portland called All Jane No Dick and that whole trip it was our first time traveling together the four of us we just had such a blast it felt like the formation of this group it was like oh these are my best friends like it was a, a, a real discovery in that weekend of, of how special our dynamic was um the first show, oh my gosh. I mean, I remember it was only improv. Our, our show structure has changed so much over the years, but that first show was uh, was just improv. And we would do what we call like a montage. We just did a series of different styles of scenes and um, no real structure in place, just kind of a, a montage. Mm -hmm. And um, we were making each other laugh and we were having so much fun with each other. We had never played together really. Um, we played like maybe individually with each other, but not all together. So it just felt right away that we had something very special and something that we all enjoyed doing so much. And so it was very clear that we needed to keep doing it. Yeah, I was also interested in something that you've mentioned previously about, you know, when you're doing a scene or you're in a moment and it can feel a little bit daunting in, in the moment that one of the things that you do for yourself is really just kind of like bring the central focus back to the scene, focus on your scene partner, focus on kind of the space around you and kind of how you developed that tool and realized that that was a way that you could bring your central focus back into what's happening in the moment and not really focus on the nerves or the stress that, that's happening. That is necessary to do improv. And I, I think I really learned that lesson and that skill from doing improv of you can't plan and you can't predict how it's gonna happen and you shouldn't. You should, the way to like, not only like do a great improv scene but then also have fun <laughs> doing improv is to let go completely of any kind of planning or thinking, like get, get out of your own way, get out of your head and just see what's happening right now in the moment. And so I really learned that through improv and I feel like that translates to acting in such an important way where in order to be alive in a scene, the way to do it is to, is to be fully focused on what is happening. What's your environment right now? Like, there's no, there's no thinking. <laughs> like there's no like, okay, and in this moment, I'm gonna do this. It's fully feeding off the energy you're getting from your scene partner and, and what's happening in the world around you. Yeah, I think I, I learned that in improv and I feel like it's one of the greatest lessons in acting I've gotten. Yeah. And with, you know, with the uncertainty of, of where things are going within a scene, the amount of trust that you have to have with your team is, is so intrinsic as well. And so it's interesting kind of like how working in improv and, and developing that trust with, with scene partners has really also informed the way that you work with castmates when you're doing film, when you're doing television, you know, and even down to working on Happiest Season, how that informed a lot of the cast relationships for you there. Yeah, totally. It's, it's all about trust and it's a, it's an ensemble, a collaborative a collaborative spirit and there was such such trust amongst all of us in the cast of happiest season that 
we were all going to bring everything we could to every scene and that I could try something or anybody could like make a choice or try something and that we would all, that nobody would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> like we would all like celebrate that and, and take, accept it as a gift to our characters and how we can play off each other. Yeah. I think that that kind of trust within a, a cast is, is really vital. Mm -hmm. And what's the accomplishment that you're proudest of from your involvement and your work on Happiest Season? Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm, I am so proud and so honored that Clea asked me to be a part of this process with her. This is, this is her story, you know, this is, um, and it's, it's inspired by her experiences. And so it's, it's really close to her heart. And she has taken such great care with this story and this movie. And I just, I'm so, so proud. I mean, we, we were talking the other day. It's like, when she asked me to write this with her, we did not know each other. <laughs> like we were, we were basically strangers, but there was, I feel like a mutual recognition of each other when we would see each other at the Veep table reads of like, there's something, there's something here. Like there's a, this is an important relationship. And I'm, I'm just so proud that I got to be on this journey with her. Yeah, it's so genuinely one of my favorite things I've, I've watched recently. And it's oh, not so just glad. stunningly funny, but also like really, really heartwarming and, and the emotional layers that you've crafted in are so beautifully done as well. So congratulations and thank you so much for diving into your process with us today. Thank you. I had so much fun talking about it. Thank you. I'm so glad you liked it. <laughs>